and welcome back. Welcome back and welcome for the first time. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Brass Online Symposium Fall 2021, day two, session three. Um, and our next session, I'm Penny Scott and um, the other organizers of this, with, um, sorry, symposium with me are Sharissa Jefferson, Christy Cunningham and Angel Truesdale. And so for our third session, we have Carmen Cole, Maggie Mahoney, and Emily Moross from Penn State University Libraries. And their presentation is, Who's Afraid of Social Justice and Business Instruction? Practical Classroom Applications to Engage and Empower Students. So thank you three for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for that um, wonderful introduction, Penny. Um, thank you everyone here for joining us today. There have been wonderful presentations, so it's really um, exciting to be amongst these wonderful presenters. Um, could I get the next slide, please, Emily? Thank you. Um, we believe that there is an opportunity for librarians uh, while engaging with students in our everyday practice as subject librarians to also pose questions about and spur students to action for social justice. For example, integrating social justice education into business information literacy instruction provides students with an opportunity to examine business resources through a socially responsible lens. Author Robert Frazier notes that social justice work addresses inequality and oppression in all its nuances, including but not limited to racism and xenophobia, classism and economic discrimination, sexism and misogyny, homophobia and heterosexism, religious and political persecution, the abuse of civil liberties, and ableism. According to a Mintel survey, 63% of US consumers agreed that brands can change society for the better. A 2020 report from eMarketer indicates that consumers expect brands to speak out on social issues, such as systemic racism and LGBTQ plus rights. Also, Standard 9 in the AACSB Guiding Principles and Standards for Business School Accreditation emphasizes engagement and societal impact. And the guidelines note that societal impact refers to how a school makes a positive impact on the betterment of society as identified in the school's mission and strategic plan. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are given as an example of how to potentially categorize societal impact. At Penn State, business students are introduced early on in their business education to the concept of corporate social responsibility and librarians often assist with finding CSR or ESG reports. Okay, so uh, for our opening activity, um, we're going to have you all try the browser-based tool Padlet if you're not already familiar. So Padlet is free up to a certain point and acts like a virtual pin board or cork board. We'll have you all try it out by answering the following prompts on the Padlet where you created for this session. And it looks like the link to the Padlet has also been dropped by Maggie in the chat. So you can open that up now. All right, so the prompts that um, we're gonna have you respond to are, have you integrated social justice topics into your business librarianship? What successes and challenges have you had with integrating social justice topics into your practice? So to respond, all you need to do is hit the plus sign and a little screen will pop up. You can title your entry or you can just write something. Um, so now here we're getting some and then just hit um, submit. So everything is anonymous as you can see. Um, and Wendy did mention in her last presentation, a similar tool to this called Jamboard. That's a Google product. Um, it also acts as a free response, anonymous response tool. It's a good alternative to Padlet. Okay, so we'll wait for some responses to come in. Okay, so someone says they haven't had an opportunity to do that yet. They are, or someone else is like, uh, we're using search examples related to social justice issues in class and activities. Um, someone says minimally, I was cautioned against it. That's interesting. Um, let's 
see. So some successes and challenges that are popping up now. Um, yes, making sure to select examples that don't re-traumatize marginalized groups. Um, so somebody used an example from Sophia Noble's work on algorithmic oppression and a student mentioned it was very upsetting. Um, so we do have to be careful and meaningful in our practice in that way. Um, conservative faculty may be a barrier. Uh, another challenge is making sure we've had the right resources to support those type of questions. Absolutely. <laughs> and yes, there has been um, some legislation, some bills, depending on your state, um, that may make it difficult to speak about these matters in the classroom. So it's definitely something to be cognizant of. Emily, are you seeing anything else that you would like to mention? Um, so I see uh, that people use examples of black owned businesses, um, marketing mental health services on campus, uh, information privilege, which yeah, is a really important topic. And we tried to handle that at Penn State. I don't know how much we directly deal with that in our business instruction. We do talk about it a lot with our um, undergraduate research exhibition. That's one of the criteria that the students need to talk about. But uh, thinking about Wendy's presentation earlier, um, information having value and our students have access as many of yours do to Mintel reports and things like that, where if your school can't afford to pay for those databases, we definitely have information privilege that other would not. Yeah. Um, so someone's having a lot of success. They are having a faculty, they have a faculty member that is willing and supportive of approaching subjects. Um, that's really good for making some inroads, hopefully in the entire college or department. Um, students have challenged them as woke and were against any type of rhetoric of that type. Okay. All right, so thank you so much for the engagement there, everyone. You got to try out the great tool if you weren't already familiar with it before. Um, I mentioned Jamboard and uh, <clears throat> it's a good way. So Padlet is a good way for us to engage students because of that anonymous format. Um, if a student in a classroom setting doesn't have a desktop or a laptop in front of them, um, they can use their phone or tablet to access Padlet as well. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Maggie Mahoney, my colleague, to speak about social justice in the LIS curriculum. Cool. Thanks, Carmen. Hi, everyone. I'm Maggie, and I'm a recent hire at Penn State, started here in August. And as we begin our discussion of social justice in business librarianship, I wanted to provide an overview of current trends in library science curriculum and how they influence the next generation of librarians. These perspectives are informed by my experience as a student in a library science program that prioritizes social justice in the curriculum, as a recent graduate of library school, and as a recent job seeker. In our introduction, we discussed how the AACSB guiding principles and standards for business school accreditation emphasize engagement and societal impact. Similarly, the ALA's standards for accreditation of master's programs in library science, their student learning outcomes state that an accredited library science program should prepare students for, quote, the role of library and information sciences in a gl diverse global society, including the role of serving the needs of underserved groups. At the University of Washington, where I completed my library science degree, social justice is emphasized throughout the curriculum. Many of the 10 student learning outcomes, which were updated in 2020, stress social justice and equitable practice. For example, learning outcome number five states, quote, value and incorporate global perspectives on effective information practices that are supportive of cultural, economic, educational, and social well being, including non Western ways of knowing. As is usually the case, equality of social justice integration 
varied across courses and by instructor. As a student, I saw social justice topics successfully included in the classroom by assigning readings outside of the realm of Western ways of knowing, approaching classes such as collection development through an equity perspective, and community engagement projects created with communities instead of for communities. One notable class, Miranda Ballarde Lewis's Indigenous Art is Indigenous Knowledge, explored Indigenous knowledge through art, architecture, history, and museum studies. The class also provided future information professionals with an introduction to culturally sensitive practices in acquiring and processing information. However, some instructors were unprepared to successfully implement social justice into their curriculum, relegating diversity to a single module, for example. These classroom experiences build on students' lived experiences and help shape the perspectives of library science students and recent graduates that are entering the field. Business libraries are hiring candidates that demonstrate an ability to work effectively with diverse student, faculty, and staff and demonstrate a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion or similar requirements. For many candidates, the job talk is an opportunity to demonstrate their creativity and their commitment to social justice. For the position at Penn State, I was asked to describe how I would approach a library instruction session for undergraduate accounting students. Part of the prompt asked me to showcase resources that students might find useful in conducting research. For this prompt, I created a library instruction class for the PSU class BA 342, Socially Responsible, Sustainable, and Ethical Business Practice. I chose this class because it's a required course for accounting majors and it aligns with my own interest in sustainable enterprise and corporate social responsibility. I came up with an activity to introduce students to both library and external resources by demonstrating how to navigate various business databases to research the corporate social responsibility of the Seattle Kraken NHL franchise. I was inspired by an activity I saw in the ALA RAS newsletter, which was a write-up by Jade Castell from Purdue University, Fort Wayne, on an activity that looked at the National Women's Soccer League as a way to explore competitive intelligence and information literacy. I love the idea of using sports to explore corporate social responsibility, and it's one that resonates with students. I think the Kraken are especially interesting because they have emerged as a new franchise in a time where there's a heightened awareness of social justice and civic engagement among brands and sports teams. I chose to showcase three subscription databases that each address different components of corporate social responsibility. The first was Mintel. I like to demonstrate resources like Mintel to help students place a product or a company within a larger trend. Another resource that I used to explore the consumer reception to corporate social responsibility is eMarketer. For example, in eMarketer, I found a report titled How Social Issues Are Sparking Action Among Brands. The final Penn State Library resource I wanted to highlight is Sports Market Analytics, which is useful for research on specific sports teams and fan markets, as well as sports news. In sports market analytics, I found a report titled, Seattle Kraken's Climate Pledge Arena is Going Carbon Neutral, an Unbelievably Challenging Task. So thanks for this little overview of the sort of the state of social justice instruction in library science curriculum and for recent graduates. And now I'll turn it back to Carmen to discuss how she has incorporated social justice into her classroom instruction. Thanks a lot, Maggie. Um, so the way I've engaged students uh, with social justice topics in our business writing course is through two versions of the same activity. Um, the business writing course is called Effective Writing, Business Writing. It's called English 202D. 
and it's an advanced writing course offered to students at the Penn State University who have fulfilled the general education composition course requirement. Business librarians from the University Library Schreier Business Library um, at University Park Campus location perform one-shot instruction in the many sections of English 202D courses offered each semester. And although assignments may differ across the English 202D courses, a very common assignment for students to complete um, is to create and um, pitch a business in a portfolio-like assignment. Um, the 202D instructors uh, invite business librarians to perform instruction on key business databases for students' research on existing companies in the same industry um, as the product or service they are conceptualizing. To introduce students to the business resources needed to complete their pitch assignment, I asked students to research a disruptor company while also considering social justice concepts. <clears throat> I decide which disruptor companies the students will research, such as Peloton, HelloFresh, Casper, Dollar Shave Club, um, and Instacart. For in-person classes, I pass around a basket of cutout slips with the name of the disruptor company the student will research. And after a short instruction session, um, typically on you know, Virgin Intellect, Ibis World, Mintel, Business Source Premier, and just an over um, general overview of company websites. Uh, the student research, the students will research their disruptor company um, on their chosen slip while assessing the sources and products or services through a social justice lens. On a slide in the front of the classroom um, during the research portion, when they're working on um, researching those disruptor companies, I ask students to consider two different prompts. When thinking about these companies who may not be served, who may not be able to access these brands or services and why, and who, uh, who, may, not, who may not be able to find out more information about these brands and companies and services like you're doing today and why. After the research portion of the session is completed, I gather the students back together as a group and ask for volunteers to share what they discovered and considered while researching their disruptor company. I'm not expecting a deep dive uh, into the social justice considerations and students often respond um, you know, with considerations like uh, economic status and ability to um, access the services online. However, the questions have been posed and will hopefully allow for more careful engagement with an examination of the products services and research resources in the future. I've also used Padlet to engage students in an online learning environment by having students complete the same activity. However, instead of bringing students back together as a group at the end to discuss their findings, I ask students to post their responses on the Padlet. And instead of passing around the slips with the name of the disruptor company on them, students may, may either um, select a company to work on individually or the instructor could create breakout rooms if that's the ability of whatever um, online conferencing software you all use for the classes, um, and then assign a company to each breakout room. Um, then they can just complete the research as a group. Um, the Padlet modification could also work as well in an in-person class, um, depending on the preference of the instructor. And Padlet is accessible to a certain point. Uh, it has a default sans serif font. Background colors can be changed and text can be highlighted. And it does work well with a screen reader as navigation is possible and its content can be read out. However, users cannot adjust their own contrast settings on the site. They cannot add alt text um, to any images posted and keyboard navigation must be used in conjunction with a screen reader. Padlet is working on enhancing the accessibility of their product. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Emily Moross to talk about social justice conversations in the marketing classroom. Thanks, Carmen. So we've heard a bit from different statistics and from our previous presenters about 
brands engaging more with activism. Um, and social justice is therefore becoming an important part of marketing for many companies, as you may have noticed. According to recent research from Mintel, the majority of consumers have either positive or neutral associations with brands who engage with activism, meaning that companies may need or want to take an activist position in their advertising and philanthropy in order to maintain a younger consumer base. Older consumers are generally more likely to have negative associations with brand activism. Depending on the target demographics for a brand's key consumers, they must take important, make important decisions about how to incorporate social justice and activism into their marketing efforts, if at all. Therefore, it's very important that students understand how to conduct the research that will help a company make this decision. It can't be something entered into lightly. Marketers must examine all sides and present the possible scenarios for engaging in or abstaining from brand activism. This is a great way to structure these conversations if you feel that there may be pushback from faculty or students, though in my experience, I have not encountered any pushback to um, incorporating these topics in my classroom. Faculty buy-in for social justice topics doesn't have to be hard to build. I realize, depending on your state, that may be a little bit more challenging, um, but there's ways that I think we can think about this and incorporate it in a way that hopefully shouldn't raise anyone's uh, hackles. A marketing professor that I often work with prefers to use hands-on real-world projects to give students experience thinking through a work situation like they would uh, during an internship or in their future careers. He also often picks examples that are in the news, which students may read about in their various um, readings in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, or on social media. When I had to transform my instruction to remote synchronous during the pandemic, I wanted to get creative in walking students through researching a marketing situation. And I found a great real world example that gave students an opportunity to engage with current marketing scenarios. As I'm sure you've noticed, a number of brands have become more activists in their promotions and sponsorship decisions in the last few years, reaching a peak in the summer of 2020 following the murder of George Floyd. Last academic year, the Sunday before I met with the professor's introduction to marketing class was the Super Bowl. During the game, the NFL ran an ad called Inspire Change, documenting its efforts to combat systemic racism in the United States and highlighting the league's $250 million commitment to making inroads for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I decided to use this ad as the basis for research and discussion from a marketing perspective on the role of activism in advertising, adapting a case study from a previous edition of the class's textbook to serve as a starting point for research and discussion. On this slide, you'll find the scenario I used as the basis for our in-class research and discussion, which I presented to students in a Google Doc. So if you were here for uh, Morgan and Summer's session, I did it very similarly to how they used the Google Doc in the class. Google Doc is great for collaborating in a remote environment. Before the class, I set up my document with content and questions and then allow anonymous editing. Through our, throughout our session, students respond to prompts directly in the document. And if you've taught via Zoom, you probably understand that it can be really isolating. Students may not want or may not want to be or may not be able to turn on their cameras or use their microphones for a number of reasons. And the chat feature in Zoom is not very interactive and I'm the one that's screen sharing right now. So I see that there are some chats there and I can't read them because I'm screen sharing. <laughs> so you may have run into that problem yourself. In the Google Doc, we can see everyone who's writing and we can interact with them via what they type. I think that this brings connection to a remote environment and it helps keep students engaged because they can't become passive and tune out like they might during a lecture. And as um, Carmen mentioned for Padlet, uh, using Google Docs gives the students who may need some accessibility features a little bit of flexibility to use a screen reader, change the size of the font, things like that. Um, earlier in our remote learning period, I found that many people were frustrated because students were not using those interactive features of Zoom not turning on their camera or wouldn't leave it on for the whole class um, and students would not use their microphones. So there's many reasons that students might uh, feel this way. We know that it's exhausting to be on Zoom all day and they might want to protect their mental health or their energy by limiting camera and microphone use or they could live in an unstable or an unsafe environment and they don't want to show that location to others via a camera. Um, as our own presenters are experiencing today, you may not have a strong and reliable internet that's needed to support a video feed. And everyone wants to feel um, safe and maintain their privacy and not feel surveilled. So for all of those reasons, uh, it was important to find another way to communicate and connect as an issue of equity for my students. So this is actually a little social justice uh, stance of my own beyond the topic.
Further, the anonymity provided by the Google Doc, as I don't require my students to log into their accounts, can allow freedom to share things that students may not be comfortable saying out loud. It can be difficult to take a contrary position in front of your peers or to share something that's very personal. By typing it in the document without a name attached, students can feel a little safer sharing their honest opinions. And so I'm speaking mostly about doing this in a remote environment, but using Google Docs can also be really helpful in an in-person setting where students might be hesitant to raise their hand, speak out loud, and again, share those contrary posi positions to the rest of their classmates. So these are the discussion questions that we use in the class. Um, and I asked them to research them and respond to them by providing evidence that they found in their databases. For each question, I recommended resources that they should search for the topic. Students then became more familiar with the databases they would be expected to use throughout the semester by researching the prompts, and they learned what kind of information is available in each database that we used. They researched reporting on the NFL, as well as the demographics of the teams and their fans, which is something they would need to do for any marketing project. I like that we were having an important conversation about a social justice issue while also learning the basics of researching within the discipline. I work with a variety of business classes, and while some of the courses encourage students to take a critical look at the environment of business, many of those are electives, and students are often working on individual projects that deal with a specific issue of personal interest rather than having large discussions about social issues. I chose this topic because it wasn't simple. When I work with classes, I always try to pick a demonstration topic that has a critical aspect to it because I find those make for better discussions than something very basic or straightforward. In this case, students did not have to have individual topics or projects to work on yet. So I wanted to use something that was broad and engaging that they'd likely at least heard of previously, even if they hadn't researched the topic too much. And everyone probably had a personal opinion on whether or not they thought that uh, the NFL should be engaging in activism this way. So, as I mentioned earlier, brand activism and alignment with specific politics is becoming very commonplace. As marketing professionals, these students may be expected to navigate similar situations for their employer or for a client. The instructor recommended I take a look at the case studies in their textbook for an example to work on. I found an older example that asked the students to evaluate a volunteer campaign for the United Way that was promoted by the NFL. Prior to last summer, the NFL was pushed towards more conversations on racism and police brutality by Colin Kaepernick's kneeling protests during the national anthem and his later ostracization by the league. The role of race in sports has become a common, though controversial, discussion point. Another inescapable reality of professional sports is that they are a business and are managed as such. Given the activism that individual players and now the league were showing, I felt that students would have a lot to say about the marketing aspects of these decisions. And they did. <laughs> so moving forward, we'd like to share, we did share many ideas today about how we incorporate social justice topics into business instruction in natural ways that complement course content and business competencies that students need to learn. You now might be wondering, how do I get started with this myself? The simplest answer is to just get started. Take a look at your common instruction and identify one lesson that could be slightly tweaked to include a social justice topic. If you typically take topics from students off the fly, one adjustment might be to use an example topic first that incorporates a social justice theme. If you're not sure which topics might work best, it's always a great idea to consult with the course faculty about the key themes of the course. Social justice topics are probably already included, but they might not be very obvious. You might want to start by asking what ethical concepts or topics are discussed in the course, as these can generally be related to social justice. And if we're thinking about the AACSB standards, there should be business ethics topics baked into every course. Beyond instruction, it's important to evaluate our collections as well to ensure good representation of historically marginalized voices. This can also apply in the classroom by accepting resources that are not only scholarly peer-reviewed articles, as Summer and Morgan mentioned. We realize that course faculty may set different standards for this that could make this particular change difficult, but something that you might want to mention during your instruction that would also align with the ACRL framework guidelines for authority is construction and contextual, as um, Wendy mentioned. So we have lots of connections before, between all of today's sessions. Ultimately, it's important to remember that this work is ongoing and usually collaborative. Treat it like any other subject you're working to gain mastery of. Seek out experts, have conversations with colleagues, attend professional development, and above all, read. Find or create in-person or virtual groups where you can share ideas, learn from each other, and provide encouragement and moral support. 
This isn't easy work, and the more people you include in your journey, the better it will be. So now we just want to go over our takeaways from today's session. We'll be providing you with a folder that has the link uh, that has our slides, our handouts, the Padlet, um, and suggested readings, recommended websites, and the lessons plans from each of our examples. So the um, bit.ly that is on the screen, so it's bit.ly slash capital B-R-A-S-S -S, lowercase S-J-21, uh, bit.ly is case sensitive, um, will take you to all of those resources. And the link for the Padlet will be at the top of the handout document. We'll, we will keep that Padlet live for two weeks following the session, and then we'll archive that. And the link for the folder will be placed in the chat to get to all of those as well. So we will now move things into questions. Um, you can also feel free to contact us with any comments, questions, thoughts, or ideas that you may have after the session. We'll be putting our email addresses in the chat, and you can also find them on our handout. And we're going to move into the Q&A. Uh, we thank you all for attending today. And while we wait for individual questions, we do have some guided reflection questions. So if you, <clears throat> you don't have a question to ask us, you might think through some of these, such as what goals do you set for self-education? Um, what courses or subjects already include a discussion of social justice in business from your school? And can you modify current lessons to include social justice issues as examples? Thank you, Maggie, Carmen, and Emily. Um, I'm happy to moderate if there are any questions. Of course, people can just unmute also. I am I am monitoring the chat right now. And I had a question if you had the reflection questions typed up somewhere. So I thought because I thought they were very interesting. We oh, did, but there we go. There we go. Thanks, Carmen. Yay. I thought I had a slide with them, but they don't appear to be there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. Um, and while we're waiting, uh, Carmen, Maggie, and I also thought that we would share um, some of our own work on this. <clears throat> um, so what feedback have you received from students who have taken part in these sessions? Um, Carmen, Maggie, or I guess Carmen, <clears throat> Maggie, I don't know if you have feedback to share, but Carmen, I don't know if you have anything to share first. I have had a really easy time integrating this into my instruction for English 202D, um, that business writing class. I haven't had the opportunity to do it in any of my other business classes that I do, um, usually because those assignments are very, they're laid out already and we're speaking very specifically to something um, for the instructor. But I also present on this type, I do this activity in, um, or similar activity um, for the College of Information Sciences and Technology at Penn State. That's my main liaison area. And it's also been well received. Yeah, I've also only had good feedback. Um, and like I said, students had a lot to say. So it wasn't um, like I was waiting in a room of silence <laughs> um, with people not offering their opinions. Um, I think that as people shared in the Padlet, there's this can be pretty fraught, especially depending on where your school is and who the teaching faculty are that you're working with. Um, so with my example, you know, it wasn't being presented as here's what I think or what you should think. It was, here's how we need to evaluate what the league is doing and what people may think about it. So as a consumer, what you think about it is valid to think or to at least discuss. Um, so I think that that helps in not necessarily leading students into one particular direction and framing it as this is a business decision. Um, and so we need to look at the different aspects of who we're going to um, bring into our you know, consumer pool with this and who we might alienate from our consumer pool with this kind of action. And another thing I was going to mention too is, you know, today we talked specifically about instruction, but these are things that we should be considering in all aspects of our practice, in my opinion. I think Maggie and Emily agree, but, you know, are we representing um, historically minoritized populations in our collections? Are we doing so in our research consultations? 
are we simply, you know, referring them to the same sources that are paywalled, you know, perhaps written by um, a certain majority population over and over again. Um, so it's kind of starting to lessen our reliance on those type of things, um, like in the first presentation <clears throat> that Summer and her colleague um, mentioned. So even thinking about those non-traditional resources and how that could broaden the range of voices brought into our conversations in all aspects of our practice. And while we're waiting again, do we want to share what our personal goals are for self-education? Um, I think one of the really great things about being at Penn State, um, I just participated in a retreat for all of our different groups that do that uh, relate to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in some aspect. We actually have 16 groups <laughs> that, that touch on that in some way. And so we were all able to kind of get together and talk about what our goals um, and our objectives are for working within our own libraries. Um, and so that's been really beneficial. Um, we have monthly discussions uh, with our colleagues as well on uh, different, uh, we can do film discussions, there's book discussions that usually tie into DEIA. And those are things that started during the pandemic um, when we went remote um, that we have kept in place now that we're back in the office. And that's not only been a great way for me to learn, um, but it's been a really good, great way for me to meet other people within the libraries who aren't like me. Um, and I think that that's really important as well as, you know, you need to have a broader circle um, that you're working with who aren't just people who look like you do and who think like you do and have the same job as you. I know one thing I'm really big on and some of you may be engaged with this, but library Twitter is a thing. And <laughs> um, especially if you follow the Crit Lib discussions or look at any of their resources on their website, um, they, you know, the topics will often point to readings, videos, podcasts, things like that, um, that can help enhance our uh, practice in these ways. Um, and also too, I'm a really big advocate of, you know, I, met, I know it was mentioned before, like, oh, well, students may get their news um, off of social media websites and stuff. I think, you know, part of our obligation obviously is to, um, you know, help with information literacy, right? But um, it's also where I've gotten some of my information. And um, after, you know, checking on things, verifying things um, to the best of my ability, uh, it's been really good to integrate into my practice. It's things I never would have known about or thought about um, had I not had my attention drawn to them on like Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, things like that. How about you, Maggie? Yeah, I agree with both of you. I also think that, um, you know, professional development opportunities such as this one, but even ones that aren't necessarily targeted towards business librarianship specifically, but just broader about social justice in instruction and in your librarianship practice, those concepts you can bring back to your subject specific work, um, you know, with a little bit of your own creativity and your ability to draw from the sort of business specific community of practice to adapt adapt these sort of, you know, broader ideas and themes around social justice and librarianship, we can make it subject specific. And yeah, it's great to have a, a really clever team to work with too on projects like this. So we have another six minutes for any questions that people might have or we can keep, uh, and we also welcome anyone to share their thoughts on um, any of the reflection questions in the chat as well. You can feel free to use your microphone. Um, at my campus, most of our business, or I guess all of our business students take um, international business and society and other students can take it as a writing intensive elective. Um, and so that's the biggest place where I come in contact with students that are um, evaluating some aspect of social justice within business, they have to write um, an individual term paper on a topic of their choosing. And that's been really interesting to work with those students over the last six years um, and just see all the different topics that are coming in. Um, a lot of them, in my experience, have dealt are dealing with fast fashion. 
Um, and so that's been interesting to observe. Um, I've also had to kind of like rein myself in from some of them. I had a student come in this semester who was doing a project on electric vehicles. And uh, those are just kind of uh, a rabbit hole of ethical issues. <laughs> so trying to narrow to just one with that was, was a bit of a challenge. Um, Maggie and Carmen, I don't know if you have any other classes that you work with where you come in contact with a lot of individual student topics that deal with social justice, but that's where that's where I see most of mine. Um, the at University Park campus location, the class that the business library is embedded in, it's called Management 301. It's the entrance mm -hmm. to major class um, at the Smeal College of Business. And we work on with them on a um, company information assignment. So all the students are assigned a Fortune 1000 company and um, they have to do a report on it. And then they we meet with every single student. Um, there can be sometimes over 1600 students <laughs> like one semester. So it's quite an undertaking, um, but we have collaborated with the instructor um, to integrate uh, a corporate social responsibility aspect into the assignment. Um, and then students have to compare an example company. So this year, Maggie thought up the great idea to use the Walt Disney Company. They examine their CSR practices and then um, compare, compare them to those of their company. So I think that's also a really good um, example too of how students can engage early on um, without like a super deep dive, but knowing that the considerations are there. Okay, so we have someone asking, does anyone care to share any of their favorite social media accounts for Crit Lib, social justice library stuff? Uh, there's a good TikTok account. Thank you from, I know this TikTok account, um, from the indigenous perspective. Um, and we can also amend our handout. I'm happy to drop some um, Instagram and Twitter handles um, and whatnot. Carmen is much more involved in this space than I am. I usually see what she shares. <laughs> but we can definitely add those to the handout, especially if anyone else has others that they'd like to share. Yeah, free feel to email us, you know, send them along and we'll add them as well, so. I don't get on Twitter too often. I'm very oh. on Twitter, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any questions before we end the day? I don't think I see anything else. Penny, do you have anything? I don't see anything else. So, um, and of course the great news is that the conversation doesn't have to end because um, everyone can contact you. And first I wanna say thank you so much, Maggie, Carmen, and Emily for your session.